Chief Chris Kyle, a Navy SEAL, is officially the most lethal sniper in U.S. history. Five bronze stars, two silver stars. What's up, Fellowship Church? All right. We have a special guest this weekend, a guest who is maybe the, the, the best we've ever had in the history of our church. But before I introduce him, I want to say hi to all of you guys at all our different environments. My name's Ed. I'm Pastor of Fellowship. If you're in Miami, if you're downtown Dallas, downtown Fort Worth, Plano, or right here in gorgeous Grapevine, or watching online, welcome to the greatest church, I believe, in the Western Hemisphere, <laughs> Fellowship. There's no place like America. There's no country like our nation. And so often, we forget what we should remember and remember what we should forget. And one of the things that we're so forgetful is the fact of what people have done, what they're doing, what they're going to do to secure and keep securing our freedom. On this weekend, in which we honor the whole aspect of freedom and we remember our nation and, and, and remember the men and women who have fought and spilled their blood on battlefields for us. We have invited Chris Kyle, who has written the blockbuster bestseller, American Sniper. Chris is a legend in the Navy SEALs. He has recorded more kills than any soldier in the history of the United States military. He's an unbelievable guy, a guy who has some stuff to teach us, and we're so, so fortunate and so honored to have him. Let's give him a crazy Fellowship Church round of applause as we stand in his honor, Chris Kyle. Chris, great to have you, man. I appreciate you having me. Have a seat. Welcome. Chris Kyle. Yes, sir. Chris, please, please be seated. It is, it is great to have you here, man. It's awesome being here. Thank you. Yes, sir. And man, I'm, I'm so excited because uh, I know you do so much for the families of, of, of victims in, in the war, and you've done so much to secure our freedom. And, and, and thankfully, I've not read your book yet. I'm supposed to read it. I have it on my Kindle. But I knew, I had this vibe that we were going to meet, so I didn't want the book to kind of taint what we we're going to talk about. But hey, welcome again. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm glad you didn't read it either because there's some bad words in there here and there. Well, I can, <laughs> I can handle it. I can handle it. I mean, we're talking about life and death. But Chris, tell me about yourself. Where, where are you from originally? I was born and raised in Texas, uh, born in Odessa. Dad worked for the phone company, so about every four years we moved and all over west, south, and then finally around the Dallas area. Really? Yes, sir. Well, Chris, growing up, did you, uh, obviously, um, um, you're in great shape. I mean, have you, have you been involved, like, in sports, and did you hunt, fish, and all that? Or tell me about your, your, your background, basically. I was never a big fisherman. Although, I do it yeah. now, because my son, there you go. he loves it, so I well, have See, I, you know, I love fishing. That, that, well. That's a biblical sport. You know I that. just hate sitting there waiting, and you can't see yeah. anything. Now, I'll sit there all day waiting for a deer and not yeah. see anything. But at least then when one comes, I can see nature and all this. Exactly. Staring Fishing, at yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So anyway, you, you grew up being involved what, in the outdoors some? Definitely. Uh, hunting, you know, going out, sporting clays and everything. Then, uh, you know, I raised cattle and horses, and we showed everything, but also working on my dad's ranch. But it was uh, that, and then I played football, baseball, and uh, rodeo. Now, what, what was your favorite sport, if you had to choose one of those? Oh, I, I did have to choose, and I ended up choosing rodeo. Yeah. That was the thing I was the best at out of the three, but I wish I would have stuck with baseball. I, that's my favorite sport. Really? Now, what, what did you do as far as rodeo? What, what, what event? Saddle bronc. Really? Wow. And back then, I was 175 pounds. I'm 230 now, so I was a little skinny. Yeah. So did you know... Um, at, a, at a young age that you might take the path of being in the military or, or not? I, I had two dreams growing up. 
and you know, I wanted to be a cowboy and I wanted to be in the military. Set my goals pretty high. Yes. But uh, I did the cowboy stuff for a while. Once I graduated high school, I was going to join the Marine Corps. <clears throat> decided, well, before someone else is telling me what to do, besides mom and dad, I'm going to yeah. go to college, have some fun. Yeah. Went to college, got in a rodeo accident, had pins and screws put in my arm, and then the Marines wouldn't take me. So I got, kept working on the ranches and figured, all right, this is what I'm going to do for a living. And I got a real nice, polite letter from Tarleton State. Yeah. saying, uh, you've been here for two and a half years. We politely invite you not to come back next semester. <clears throat> so, okay. You know, I'm a, they don't care if you come or not, so I didn't care if I showed up or not. And I tend to major more in barology back then. And <laughs> barology? So, oh, yeah. Yeah. I've I, heard about that major. <laughs> I used to be a pro at it. Did you really? Oh. But uh, I finally cleaned up my act, started working on these ranches for a living, and then about the time I was 24 or 23, I got a call saying, hey, uh, we're willing to take you in. That's more of acceptable practice to have those kind of surgeries. So mm -hmm. apparently recruitment was pretty low yeah, because they kept it for those years and then finally tracked me down. So I went in to go talk to the recruiter, and uh, a Marine recruiter was literally out to lunch. So as you're walking out the strip mall, you've got all the other armed services there, and those recruiters are like snipers. Boy, they're yeah. just shooting things at you, trying to pick you off to get you to come to them. The Navy guy goes, come here. And I went, I don't want to sit on a ship. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, he goes, no, there's something called SEALs. You can go do it right now. So we started talking about it, and I went, okay. And the recruiters are like professional car salesmen. They they're are good, the, aren't they? They're the scum of the earth. Okay, so... <laughs> So Chris, from there, all of a sudden, you, you, you go where? where? Where do you go? I, mean, I went to boot camp, and then at the time, you still had to pick out, it's called your A school, MOS, or your specialty. Mm -hmm. I was going to be an intelligence specialist, because my recruiter told me I was going to be like James Bond. Uh -huh. so I figured, you know, if I can't be a SEAL, I'm going to go be James Bond. Yeah. So I did that, and then went over to California and went through BUDS, the boot camp to be a SEAL. Now, we hear a lot about BUDS, and I know people have watched documentaries on it, et cetera. Did you have to train a lot before BUDS, or, or did you just kind of go in, I'm green, I'm just going to go I, for it? When I went to A school, and it was in, I got lucky, it was in uh, Damnick, Virginia, mm -hmm. which is where SEAL Team 6 is. Yes. So I got to see them and tried doing what they were doing to work out and get into shape. And so when I went over there, I was in decent shape, wasn't in great shape. And the thing about BUDS, it's 90% mental. They will get you physically there. I went in barely being able to do the six minimum pull-ups, and by the time I left BUDS, I think my exit test, I did 34. Mm. So your mind is what holds you back. No matter if it's BUDS or anything. Your, That's a great point. Your body so, can do so, you so much it, more. Yeah. So your body can do so much more than you realize it's that, it's that mental game. Right. And yeah. that's why people drop out. Yes, definitely. I mean, we've had NFL football players come through, some of these other great athletes. But I think also part of BUDS is, with, along that mental game, is all through sports and everything, I was never a natural athlete. I had to work at everything mm -hmm. to be on varsity, to be a starter. It was a constant struggle and a yes. challenge for me to get there. So when you go to BUDS, you face challenges. Well, I was used to trying to overcome them. Some of these people have never had to face it because mm -hmm. everything came to them naturally. Nobody's going to naturally get through buds. Really? Oh, what, no. did, did, you, did you have time uh, uh, during the buds where you thought, okay, I'm ready to throw the towel in? Did you oh, ever, yeah, definitely. Really? I mean, especially laying out there in the, in the surf zone where the water just trickles up on you and then goes back mm -hmm. and you're freezing. We call it jackhammering where you're just yeah. uncontrollably shaking and... You know, if that bell would have been closer, you know, my laziness saved me because I didn't want to have to walk all the way to the end of the beach. <laughs> really? Yeah. Okay, la last question about Buds. What physically was the most difficult part for you, Chris? I, it was just the constant physical exertion of go, 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 go. Mm -hmm. it's, whether it's doing push-ups, running in your boots and camis on the soft sand or lifting the telephone poles over your head. Wow. So what, what did you learn about teamwork in, 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 this, 
adventure and this challenge because obviously you have to rely on on your teammates on 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 the guy to your right the guy on your left tell me about that well definitely i mean it's whether you're in the boat paddling around even if you're the strongest guy if you outpower everybody else you're just gonna go in circles and the same with the log if you're the only one putting out trying to lift it you're gonna break so you have to you know pep mm -hmm. talk everybody get everyone on the side and get them motivated keep everyone going and officers enlisted are all treated the same in buds you're right there next to each other okay so from there obviously you 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 made it you passed i know that was a great a great moment and then what, what happened after after buds after buds you go to advanced training which is a seal qualifying training sqt and that's where they they're done beating you now it's just okay let us try to teach you something in a short period of time before you go to your platoon. And then you're stuck in there with these guys who have experience and your learning curve is steep. So they're putting- Okay, so you're a SEAL uh, once you pass. No, no you're still not. not okay, you have to go you. through, okay. Well, when I went through, you went through SQT, which is like four months, and then you still weren't a SEAL when you got to the team. You had to do six months to a year as a new guy and for SEALs, it's embarrassing to walk around in a Navy uniform without a trident because uh -huh. you see yourself as this elite warrior. And the only thing that makes us any different in uniform is that trident. Yes. So you don't get to wear it. Now I think the guys get it right out of SQT. Mm -hmm. They're awarded their trident unless you come to my platoon and we strip it off of you. Okay. So I, I've heard, though, too, correct me if I'm wrong, that the, the, the next level past buds is a whole nother level. It is like, as you said, the learn, learning curve is like this. And then is that when you went to sniper school? Is that what sniper, no. well, sniper school is on top of that, correct? It's on top of that. Woo. I, as a new guy, when I got to the platoon, finally got my bird, I wasn't allowed to go to sniper school because you have to prove yourself, prove you're responsible enough and you have the tools needed to be able to become a good sniper. Okay. So I had to do my first new guy deployment and then was allowed. And th that was super intense. It, it was intense. I I mean, mean, tell, tell us about a typical day in sniper school. Well, I mean, I mean they definitely you stress you out, but it's, you know, they can't shoot at you, so they just. Yeah, they, how do they stress you out, though, Chris? How keeping you, you up late. It's long hours. You do a lot of uh, PT, the uh, physical training, okay. whether running, push ups, pull ups, just really trying to get you stressed, wore down. And then they yell at you the whole time. It's just like being back in buds. I mean, you went from the point to where you were in buds and the instructor's cussing you, telling you you never make it. Yeah. And then you become a new guy. And while you're a new guy, your whole platoon treats you like dirt. And wow. you get all the little dirt jobs. Yes. And then uh, after you get back, you're thinking, okay, I made it. I'm no longer a new guy. And then you go to sniper school and I'm like, guess what? Starts. You're a new <laughs> guy again. Starts all over again. Man. So they put through all this stress, all this, as you said, PT, right? Physical? Yes, sir. Physical okay, training. Okay. So then you have to shoot after that. Yes, sir. Definitely. And then it's, uh, well, it's bro our sniper school is the longest one mm -hmm. in the armed services just because it doesn't mean it's any better. We just have more weapon systems than the other forces do. Right. So we have to learn every individual weapon system, how far to shoot them, their capabilities and everything. But then it starts off with uh, cameras, computers, and radios because the biggest job of a sniper is to get out there, get the intelligence, and send it back to the That's guys. That's so incredible, Chris. I mean, not only are you physical specimen, hand-eye coordination, mentally tough, but you had to be smart as a whip. Wow. Uh, so you had to learn all of that stuff, how to shoot with pretty much anything, and then, you know. Well, th there's a lot of math involved. I mean, especially when you're shooting past 1,000 yards, you have, you know, the Coriolis effect, which you've got the curvature of the Earth. The earth isn't flat, so you have to learn how your bullet's traveling, and they all have a right hand twist in them. The rifles are all right hand twisted, so when that bullet comes out, it starts to spin to the right over a period of time, so you have to factor that in, take into effect all the different winds, wow. and then the rotation of the earth, because nothing you shoot is actually a static target. Everything is moving. So if you're shooting a target that's in the east, you know, is it moving east to west? Is it moving west to east, or is it Depends on where you are on the map is how the earth is turning. Hmm. So tell me, Chris, from, from there, you get to sniper school, and then after that, what, what, what happens? 
I go back into my platoon, we start training up, getting ready to go, and we get deployed overseas in um, Iraq. While I was there then, I was uh, called in by the Marine Corps to go do the assault on Fallujah. So we did the whole assault, and that was six weeks out there, and you know, I, I did a radio show the other day and asked, well, what's the longest you've ever gone without a shower? Four weeks. And then, you know, there was a girl sitting next to me, so I put my arm around her and I said, that was this month. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Chris, tell me about fear. How, how do you, like I should say, how did you deal with fear and how do you deal with fear? It's definitely nerve wracking, I guess. Over time, you kind of get hardened to it, and in a way, you kind of you accept death. You're there for a reason. You know what the possible outcomes could be, and you're willing to give your life. I mean, every vet who goes overseas, he writes out a blank check to the country and says, this is up to the value of my life. Mm. And, you know, fortunately for me, mine didn't, I didn't have to give the full amount. And, and, and so many... Of your, of your friends, people that you were very, very close to, Pate. Yes, definitely. And you know what, what I'm, I'm sure, so talk to me about this. You know, you, we think about America. What a great country. The freedom we have is so often, I know you know this as well as anybody, you look around and, and people don't, don't realize the fact that the freedom is, is not free. There's right. a cost to it. There's, there's a price blood is being shed and and uh do you tell, tell me about just talk about our country a little bit how, how, how do you feel about america right now i mean i'm, I'm extremely proud and patriotic of this country yes. no matter who's in charge you know you may hate who's running the country at the point but no matter how bad it is right now this is still the greatest place in the world to live and that's right But, uh, you know, every color in that flag, every symbol in that flag stands for something. And the biggest yeah. thing is that red stands for the blood. That's right. And it has been paid over and over. And whether you want to go protest, that's been paid for you to go do that. If you want to support the troops, that's been paid for you to go do that. Everything has been paid in full. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the, the parallel, too, with the Christian life, you, you mentioned the blood. You, know, you think about Jesus. You know, paid in full. He, he paid by shedding his blood on the cross for all of our sins. And, and so often people trample over that, and they trample over also the blood that so many people, like you guys, you, other, other men and women, other uh, uh, soldiers from America have shed on battlefields that you know, we'll never, ever know about. But it, it would be so... Um, but in no way are we like Jesus. Do what? No way are we like Jesus. Oh, no, no, we're not okay. like Jesus. I'm just, just saying. saying there's the, you know, there's, there's that. Maybe, you know, I, I'm saying I'm gonna that. I'm going to say, don't compare me too much to him. No, 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 no. But um, uh, that is, I, I don't know, I just, I'm really burdened, Chris, for our country because, you know, I just see a, 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 a slow and now kind of a slippery slide away from, from some of these values that have been modeled and taught, obviously in your family growing up and through the military, and one being just the, the sense of authority, the sense of, okay, this person's in charge. And I might not like this person, I might not dig this person, but they're in charge. And, you know, the, the chain of command, the authority structure, I have to do what they want me to do. And, and really it's a it's a symbol of, of God because God has placed every authority figure in our lives over us for a certain reason. How did you learn authority in your life? Did you learn it as a kid growing up and then it was just kind of... Oh, definitely. My, that was something my dad was a strict, strict believer in was you will respect everyone, mm -hmm. even the people you don't like. Right. You know, and if it's someone in some certain position, you don't have to respect the person, but you will respect that position. That's right. And you will show respect because the only way you get it is for you to earn it, and that's by showing it. Mm -hmm. so, so what you're saying, Chris, if you're waiting to have to respect someone to follow their leadership, you'll never follow leaders. 
Right. You know what I'm saying to you? Yes, sir. I mean, there, there's always been people in my life, different coaches, professors, different people um, that I, I didn't necessarily like or I didn't always respect what they did. But as you said, I respected the position that they had. And that's something that's missing so much in our country. It, it's, it's a missing link in family so often. It's a missing link in church, in school. And, and, and thankfully, though, the military does a great job most of the time of right. this. And it definitely all starts with parenting. It does. It starts at home. And then even if you have a troubled kid, the solution is not always to send them off to the military because military doesn't fix everybody. Yep. So it's it has to start at home, and it's with the family. And the biggest part of that, I believe, is Christianity. That's right. You're believing in God, and then you believe in God, and you have that faith, it will fix most exactly. things. Because most of the time, people's problem, um, I would say all the time when it comes to authority, basically you got to say, God, you're God, I'm not. And I submit myself to your authority, and then it just plays down into everything else in every slice of life. Right. When you're on the battlefield in some faraway land, you have to rely, I know, on orders. I mean, even when you're, you know, shooting or whatever, don't you? Uh, well, we, we kind of have our overall orders before we go out. But once yeah. we're out there, then you it's, have to, it's up to us to do the right thing. But then that also means if we do something wrong, when we come back, it's us that fries. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, your training and also just that discipline of being under, you know what your orders are, so you're going to stick to those guidelines. Yes. And Chris, tell me about the camaraderie. I bet, the, is that something that you miss? Every day. Uh, Describe no. that. Mama Lee and I were just talking about that is, uh, Mark told her that these guys are my brothers, and she said, okay, you know, I, I know you like them and you love them and all this, and you spend all your time with them, mm -hmm. but they're not like Christopher, your brother. And then she said that when Mark died, that all of a sudden all these seals started coming over and just constantly being there and always being a part of the family and, mm -hmm. you know, her taking us in and us taking her in. And she goes, wow, y'all really are family. I knew my guys. Unfortunately, I knew them a lot better than I knew my wife and my kids because I, wow. the last three years of my time, I spent six months at home. The rest of the three years, I was with these guys. Huh. You know, there's a great verse in the Bible, Chris, that, that, that I, I, I wanted you to respond to. I'm sure you've read it before, but John 15, 13, it says, Greater love has no man than this, than he laid down his life for his friends. You've lived that out, and you've seen that. I, I, I mean, see it. you've seen it. And very few people have really seen that. I mean, we read it and go, wow, that's cool, that's powerful, that's inspirational. You've lived it out. Well, also, you know, the whole thing we're trying to do is raise the awareness because when you're seeing the news on and you're seeing that little ticker tape go across yep. the bottom of, you know, one, one guy died today, two troops or whatever, well, that one guy or those two guys, they were either, you know, a son, a daughter, a mother, a father. They were family member to somebody, mm -hmm. and they're not just to be counted as another number. And there's people out there laying down their lives every day for us. And even if you put cameras on us, every individual in a war zone and you watch those tapes 24 7 you would still never get the full idea of what war is until you feel it inside you that fear that adrenaline till you can smell the smells that are going on and there's certain things the cameras aren't going to pick up that you're going to hear or the the hairs on the back of your neck sticking up you're not going to get all that so you're not going to understand everything that war is because war is hell mm -hmm. it really is isn't it it is even though I say that, my wife goes, then why do you keep going back? But I felt that was my calling. That's where I was supposed to be. And even though she kept saying, you know, it's a single man's job. Mm -hmm. What if everybody said that? There yeah. wouldn't be hardly anybody in the military. And, you know, when SEALs, we have a 95% divorce rate. And my wife and I almost didn't make it. And then when she gave me the ultimatum to get out, I resented her for it. And we almost, we came even closer to divorce after getting out. But it, I resented her for making me do that because she married me knowing I was a SEAL, knowing what I did for a living. And I felt I betrayed my guys because when I stepped out, someone else had to take my spot. So I sent someone else downrange. What if he got hurt 
or what if he messed up and got someone else hurt? That's on me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But since then, we have passed it up, and it's all good. Now, how long have you been married, Chris? Ten years. Ten years. And you have children? I do. I have a seven-year-old boy and a six-year-old girl. Wow. And I actually know them now. That's fantastic. Growing up, did you know you were a great shot growing up? I mean, were no. you like, wow, no? No, my brother was always a better shot than me. And that, you know, growing up, I thought 300 yards was a long shot, you know, shooting deer. And Your then, brother was a better shot than you. He was. He even shot a turkey out of the air from a hip shot was a 30-30, <laughs> which he could never do again. But at the time of little kids, I'm going, oh, wow. Man. So he, he was definitely good. But now, you know, he's still a little brother, so I would never tell him to his face. Yeah, don't ever do that. <laughs> no. Plus, and, and, he was and so, Chris, when did, when did you know, man, I have a God-given gift for this? Um, not until my first platoon when I started to realize, you know, I'm right at, towards the top of the guys shooting in here. And then and my chief came to me and said, how would you like to go to sniper school? I was like, well, that's my dream. That's what I want. Mm -hmm. So he goes, okay we get back, then uh, you're going to go to sniper school. And then going through it, you know, I, I was middle of the pack. I'm not the greatest SEAL sniper. I'm not, just because you have the numbers, that does not make you a great sniper. In my mind, Carlos Hathcock, who only had 93 confirmed kills, is the greatest sniper, not just in America, but in the entire world. Really? He would sneak in with less technology than we have now, you know, his weapon systems weren't anywhere comparable to what we have now, but he would sneak in to take out one target, take out that target from a distance, and sneak back out, and that could take him a week. That is the true sniper, the stealthy wow. getting in and out, being able to ID a target all alone, and then take that shot and leave. Whoa. So, I mean, the, the numbers, I didn't even want that in my book. Because I, I don't care about that. That yes. you know, Whether I killed one I person or a thousand doesn't make me yeah. any more of a man. Right. I would love to be known for the number of people I saved. Mm -hmm. That's great. Wow. And Chris, you know, obviously you, you have saved scores and scores of people. Chris, I'm not, I mean, I'm not a big hunter. I mean, I've, I've, I've shot a little bit. But what is your favorite rifle to shoot? One that works. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, yeah, you have all kinds of different brands and models. you have like one that's like, this is my favorite. The GA Precision is a rifle manufacturer that I love. Okay. It's a little bit pricier and I could never buy one, but one was given to me and I love that rifle and a 308 or military, you know, 762. It's the best all around caliber because you can hog, deer hunt, you know, anything you can reach out to 1100 yards and. So it's, uh, I think it's the one. best all-around rifle. Okay. Chris, what was the longest shot you've, you've ever recorded? 2,100 yards, which is about Whoa. a mile and a quarter. A mile and a quarter. Yes, sir. I was in one village. He was in another. I was in the second story. He was on the rooftop. I saw an American convoy coming through his village. He was on the roof. He was acting a little shady. So I uh, zoomed my scope in on him to find out what he was doing and saw he had an RPG and he was mm -hmm. trying to hide from the convoy to ambush him. And so as soon as he raised his RPG, I took the shot. Mm -hmm. Wow. Everything, Chris, that you've gone through, would you do it again? Yes. If I wasn't married and didn't have my kids, <laughs> I would still be there right now. You'd be there now, would you? Oh, yes. I loved it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, there's some politics. I mean, there's always your ups and downs, oh, yeah. and no matter what job you do, you're never going to find that perfect mm -hmm. one that's always happy-go-lucky. Mm -hmm. But it felt rewarding yeah. because it felt everything I was doing was for the greater good. That's right. Everything I'm doing now is for my mm -hmm. own good. Yeah. I felt I was given back, and I was among the best of the best, and I had true brothers that if I call them right now, they'll be here if mm -hmm. I need them. That's awesome. People don't realize either, Chris, the evil that's in the world, and they don't realize the evil that we're fighting right now. Oh, it's, People have no clue. I mean, that's the thing that irritates me, is they want to show you everything our troops are doing wrong overseas. Yeah. And they want to put judgment on our troops. 
when they're not showing you why are the troops acting this way? Exactly. They're dragging our guys down the streets while they're still alive. Mm. And see, not everybody in the media is out to lunch, but a number of them are. They want to show one little aspect of it and they miss the entire picture. They, they, they miss the amazing men and women who were out there doing the stuff, shedding their blood for the freedom of this nation. And it's a travesty that, that, that we even allow it. But thank the Lord we have people like you, organizations like America's Mighty Warriors and, and, and others who are out there saying, you know what? America is the land of the free and the home of, a brave, of the brave. We're definitely one nation under God and freedom ain't free. And, and once we understand that and appropriate that and say that, and I believe advertise that, um, that's, when, that's when things will happen. So uh, one of our pastors read your book and wrote to the leader of America's Mighty Warriors and started this conversation with her. And because of this conversation, something really cool has happened. Our camp, Alasso Ranch in East Texas, is providing a week for the families and loved ones of, of those who were wounded and those who were fallen. And we're very, very excited to partner with you guys in this phenomenal organization. We really, really are. Well, I'm glad y'all are doing it. I mean, it's run by Debbie Lee, who her son Mark yeah, Lee. Yeah, tell, tell us about Debbie. Uh, well, her son Mark Lee was the first SEAL killed in Iraq. He was there with us. Uh, none of us had really met her before the fact. And then we sent four guys back Four from our platoon went back and another guy from another platoon joined up with her to escort the body back and help her with her needs. But then when we all came home, I mean, Mark was our brother. And that's one thing Debbie always says that his last gift to her was she had 16 new adopted sons. And that's wow. why we all call her Mama Lee now. She I love is. that, Mama Lee. And Mama Lee is here. She's young. Debbie Lee, would you stand? America's Mighty Warriors. Let's welcome <laughs> Debbie Lee. We'll be hearing more from her over, over the ensuing months of fellowship. Church. I like that, Mama Lee. Mama Lee. I, how about this, Chris? I would say this, too, okay? You, you said there's nothing like war. No one understands war. And I've, I've never been in a war like you've been. But I think so often we forget every day that we're in a war, and, and it's, a, it's a spiritual war. And that's one of the great things, too, that I, I love about our church. I think so often people think of Christianity as being passive. They see Jesus, as I always say, as a blue-eyed, skinny, decaf-sipping white boy. He, if you read about him and know about him, a total and complete man's man. So... One of, the, one of the great things that I love about doing ministry at Fellowship Church would be sort of the same as you talked about with your SEAL brothers and, and, and other brothers and sisters in the armed forces. We go to battle every day fighting hell and trying to, trying to take, take over hell by the square foot. And I, I think many times people look at Christianity as just chilling, relaxing, just hanging out with Christians, and that's part of it. But it's also convincing people who don't know Christ to know Christ by the power of God. And it's also going into dark places and shining the light of Jesus. So, so we're in a war. We should be warriors. We're, we're, we're made to be warriors. So what you have done and what you're involved in and what Mama Lee is doing is biblical. I believe it is biblical. Just like what we're all doing as believers. I mean, that's a biblical deal, man. Well, I mean, it's just like with Christianity nowadays. You know, everyone's getting so, like you said, pacifist about everything. Yes. And it's passive, aggressive, don't really want to upset anyone. That's right. And you're starting to get desensitized. So morals of the country are starting mm -hmm. to come down. Well, the same thing with over there. You know, it's everyone's getting desensitized to the fact of we've been at war for so long. Yes. So no one's really given the vets you know, a set, second thought as much anymore. You know, you see them in the airport, you might go shake their hand, tell them thank you. Well, we're trying to get people to take it a step farther beyond that because there's so much lip service in this country now. Why not do random acts of kindness, whether you're- I love that, that's a great 
That's a great deliverable. Random acts of kindness. What do you mean? You cook them a meal, take it to them, cook them, you know, bake them cookies, mow their yard, do chores, babysit so they can go on a date, or they can just simply take a nap. Mm -hmm. You know, just little bitty things. And if you've got the, the extra money, which I, we're not out here saying send me your money, send me yes, your money. Yeah. We know that the times are hard right now, yeah. but if you have the money, donate it to organizations like America's Mighty right. Warriors. You know, I'm telling everybody, don't just do the lip service. Yep. So I'm showing it. I'm gonna be like, look, I will lead by example. All of my profits from that book are going to Mama Lee. I love it. And to uh, Kelly Job. Kelly yeah. Job is the wife of Ryan Job, who yes. also died that, or from that day. Yeah. So they are getting the money. These guys are out there serving us. So now it's our time and our duty to serve those who have served us. Mm -hmm. Well, Chris, what's so, what's so cool is we have, we have your books at, at, at all of our campuses and in our, in our bookstores. And it's been such a delight to have you here. Thank you so much again for taking, out, uh, taking time out of your busy, busy schedule. Mama Lee, thank you for being here. I'm going to have a word of prayer, and uh, I want to pray just for our nation and for this great time. God, thanks so much for this opportunity to, to talk and just to hear from a true warrior, a true, a true hero. And Father, we, we all mess up. We all miss the mark, and, and uh, we all so often forget about the price that's been paid for our freedom here in the United States of America. And I pray that we get involved in these random acts of kindness and that we think and remember and honor the servicemen and women who do so much and who have done so much for us. And I thank you for our church as we can partner with these folks and, and we can utilize our camp and just to help and minister and to, and to heal those who've, who've gone through loss and, and, and tragedy and, and, and injury. And God, right now, I want to pray for people who need to establish a relationship with you. You know, it's all about the blood. Jesus, you, you shed the blood on the cross for all of our sins. And, and, and if you're here and you want to make this decision to receive what Jesus did for you 2,000 year ago, years ago on the cross as he paid for your sins and mine, just, just simply say, Jesus, I give control of my life to you. Here are the keys, here are the reins. You're God, I'm not. Forgive me and cleanse me. And hey, if you said that and meant it to the best of your ability, God, I turn from my sins and turn to you, Jesus. If you said that, then you have become a follower of Christ. And that's the greatest decision that you'll ever, ever make. And you will understand what freedom as you walk with him truly is. So God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this opportunity. And we thank you for our great nation. In Christ's name, amen. Hey, if you uh, prayed that prayer with me or if you want any information about the organization we discussed, if you want to get in contact with Debbie Lee or, or, or Chris or learn more about the book, just text your name to 32898. Or maybe you prayed that prayer with me to receive Christ. Again, text your name to 32898, and we'll get back to you very, very soon. Right now, we're going to receive our offering. It's our time to return to God what is already His as an act of worship. So our hosts will come forward here, and they'll come forward at our various campuses and be in prayer for us during this great, great time as uh, we continue to do what, what, what God wants us to do.